This is what, where malinformation came from. Mis, dis, and malinformation. You may have heard that phrase. Misinformation is something that is false, but you, you know, it was an innocent mistake. Disinformation is it's wrong, but you did it on purpose. Malinformation is it's right, but it still undermines public faith and confidence in something that's more important. This is why, for example, you had the censorship of COVID in the name of, of malinformation. You're banning people from telling the truth. Yes. So how are you not like just full blown on Satan's team at that point? You're ban you're not allowing your own citizens to tell the truth. You're yeah. you're forcing lies at the point of a gun. This is literally what the federal government's partners pressured using and exploiting government pressure and threatening them with with crisis PR if they uh, if they allowed true statements about COVID-19 to be articulated. If they you know, and this came out in the Twitter files for example. You know, where you had entities like the Virality Project who were who were telling Yo Roth and, and Jaya Gotti, the you know the, the former Twitter 1.0 censorship team, that you need to censor you know self-reported uh, you know vaccine adverse events because even if these things are true, they still undermine public faith and confidence in the efficacy of vaccines. They right, and the they might increase vaccine hesitancy once people realize it can hurt them. Like they don't want to take it. Right, and part of the issue is is their their initial solution to this was fact checkers. But the problem is, and, and trying to get legitimacy for censorship because fact checkers identify something as wrong. But the problem is fact checkers are slow. Fact checkers have limited influence on certain platforms. And so you can't hire enough fact checkers. And also a lot of times the fact checkers can't prove something's wrong. You're citing CDC data. You know, you're, you're citing a widely reported mainstream media uh, event, but you can still get it banned under the category of malinformation because it still undermines public faith and trust in a critical narrative. So it's sort of this censorship mercenary ecosystem created to protect noble lies, but noble lies at home and also no, and also noble lies abroad. So this is why I come back to the US State Department and maybe this is a good time to introduce, you know, the, the telegram you know, issue here, which is that you had this strange situation where the government of France arrested Pavel. And it took everyone by surprise. And this is a major, major act, which has major implications for U.S. platforms. The fact is, is if Pavel is liable for every act of speech, criminally liable, every act of speech on his platform, there's no reason that the head of Rumble, the head of X, the head of YouTube, that everybody can't be hauled in for 20 years the moment they step foot in Paris as yeah, well. They could all die in prison for letting people criticize their governments. Like, Right. It is a major diplomatic event. It impacts U.S. national champions. It impacts U.S. citizens. The U.S. embassy in France, its job, the only reason it's there is to protect U.S. national interests, U.S. citizens, and U.S. corporations from hostile foreign laws in France, hostile foreign actions by France. And given how critical Telegram is to the U.S. militarily, to the U.S. on statecraft grounds, to the U.S. on intelligence grounds. Again, as we speak, in dozens of countries, Telegram is the main artery of the CIA for, for cultivating political resistance movements. And so the impact on the United States is absolutely massive of, of doing this. And again, as, as, you know, as we discussed, the United States has funded you know, Ukraine with about almost $300 billion and Ukraine's military intelligence chiefs say that they need to get control over Telegram's back end to, to know whether or not the Russians are in control of it and to get control essentially over its front end content moderation.